time once again for Community Forum, and we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Elizabeth Murray. Elizabeth Murray served as Deputy National Intelligence Officer for the Near East in the National Intelligence Council before retiring after a 27-year career in the U.S. government, where she specialized in Middle Eastern political and media analysis. She is a member of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity and the Sam Adams Associates for Integrity and Intelligence, and her articles appear regularly in Consortium News. In 2012, she began participating in resistance action sponsored by the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action against the Trident Nuclear S uh, Missile System based at the Bangor Naval Base in Kitsap County. And in 2014, she became member in residence at the GZ Center, where she currently volunteers full time. In March of this year, she was arrested in front of Lockheed Martin headquarters in Sunnyvale, California, along with fellow nonviolence activists associated with the Pacific Life community. And she is here to talk, talk about the GZ Center and the upcoming 70th anniversary of the U.S. nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Elizabeth, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Great to be with you, Mike. So start out, tell us a bit about the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action and what was your motivation in getting involved with them? Okay, so the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action is a, it's located in Kitsap County, sort of between Polsbo and Silverdale. We sit on a, a 3.8 acre property. Um, we are neighbors with uh, the naval base. We're, it's, we actually have the border fence right there. And uh, basically it was formed to uh, resist the arrival of Trident uh, missile back in the 1970s. It was uh, founded by Jim and Shelley Douglas. Uh, the Ground Zero Center espouses uh, nonviolent resistance and we hold three actions per year. One is on Martin Luther King Day, one is on Mother's Day, and our upcoming one on the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this year is very special because we're commemorating the 70th anniversary. Um, the Ground Zero Center also has a close affiliation with uh, the uh, Nipponzan Myohoji uh, Dojo. It's a, it's a Buddhist temple over in Bainbridge Island. We have several of the monks that are uh, dedicated to being a part of our uh, peace movement. And so um, it's, a, it's an interesting place because um, there are people of all different faiths there, all different backgrounds. We have uh, atheists and Quakers and Catholics and all sorts of people. But I think the common thread is that these are all people with a conscience and these are all people who consider themselves to be stewards of the earth and want a better future for us as well as uh, the coming generations. The regular listeners to the show are probably familiar uh, with the weapons that are based there at the uh, Banger sub base, but I think there's still an uh, enormous number of people in the greater Seattle area that don't realize that 20 miles from Seattle is the largest repository of probably nuclear weapons could be in the world. Can you talk a little bit more about what's based there? Absolutely. So um, at the at the naval base itself, um, I believe there are, I guess, eight uh, Trident submarines, and, and all of them have the capacity to hold uh, roughly, I think, 100 nuclear warheads. And uh, actually, there was a really great program last night on uh, the PBS NewsHour about the Trident, and one of the statistics that they gave was that the one Trident uh, missile could uh, actually, uh, or has the, the nuclear power of about uh, 600 Hiroshima's. And uh, one Trident missile could actually destroy an entire country, and a fleet of Trident submarines uh, could destroy possibly the entire world. So it's really uh, dangerous because these submarines are all on hair trigger alert. So yeah, we... We um, were in a very delicate situation there because it's not just if there would be a nuclear war, but if there were any kind of mishap, um, the nuclear fallout could drift easily the 20 miles over to Seattle and it would affect this entire area. And you're right, I think that uh, people in Seattle are, are probably not aware of the danger that lurks just 20 miles away. So this, this is our concern is do we really need all these weapons. 
and the mishaps obviously could happen in the the subs are regularly reloaded and worked on uh, when they're not out at sea i think there's at any given time there's at least one or two subs that are being serviced there and with the the recent um ground zero lawsuit which i know you're not privy to all the details on that but uh there's interesting documents that came out about just like the blast zone surrounding there that again people even people in the local community there are completely unaware of right that's that's right in 2012 the ground zero center filed a, a lawsuit in order to prevent this second uh, explosive handling wharf from being built and i guess um, it would be a real a really big uh, uh, damage to the environment and to the to whatever whales are around there dolphins and such and there are residents of Kitsap County that would be well within the blast zone. And I believe a partner to this lawsuit is also the Squamish Indian tribe. So um, I think it's a good thing that we're getting a lot of partners coming together to, to protect the environment and people who are cons really concerned about what could happen. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Eric Schlosser's book, Command and Control. Uh, I would strongly encourage your listeners to pick that book up and, and read how common it is for there to be accidents in nuclear missile silos and you know in the nuclear missile environment um, it's almost a, a matter of luck that we're all still here uh, and that book makes it eminently clear so um, in fact that reminds me of um, what, there's so many inspiring people at the ground zero center uh, one of them is is a woman called Mona Lee who uh, used to work at the Bangor missile base and she said that the moment of truth for her came when she had the occasion to be right up next to a Trident missile and she reached out and touched it and she said that at that point she was just overcome with a wave of nausea when she realized how many people this one missile could kill and that she might be one of the employees that could push, push a button and cause this and this was the beginning of the end of her career at the naval base but there's so many by the way so many interesting people that that come to ground zero and uh, you know that volunteer their time there and actually the history is very interesting and one one of my inspirations is uh, a gentleman called Bob Aldridge who uh, used to work for Lockheed Martin during the Vietnam era and he was a nuclear engineer and when he realized that his work was directly contributing to uh, the the bombing and the killing of civilians in hospitals and civi in civilian infrastructure in Vietnam, he decided he couldn't do that work anymore. And he it's a great story. He gathered his family together and mentioned to them what his crisis of conscience was. And the family agreed to tighten their belts that he would no longer work there. I think his wife went out and, and got a job, and he learned to cook and and raised their children. And at the most recent uh, uh, Pacific Life community, um, we had a, a, a Skype conference with Jim and Shelley Douglas, the founders of Ground Zero, and, and the Aldridge family who brought their children and their grandchildren just to show that the family had thrived, despite you know not him, him having given up this obviously very well-paying job, which at the time was in Hawaii, and they had to, to give up that life completely. But there's so many stories of people who shifted their life following their conscience and it's it sounds very idealistic but the people at ground zero show that it can be done i mean you know we all have to eat we all you know have have to have either some kind of a job or income but um there there are options and it's it's something worth exploring if it's if it's something that that uh, that appeals to you so Mona Lee's story, which I'd never heard before now, is is interesting from the standpoint that a lot of times one will read in the paper or, or, or comments, let's say, on uh, videos related to actions that the Ground Zero Center takes outside the gates of the Bangor sub-base there. It's people say, well, what's the point? Why are these people, you know, leafleting? You're not going to change anybody's mind. And... Um, I know I've heard over the years of multiple people who worked on the base that had their minds changed by the people who leaflet, which you regularly participate in now as well. 
Absolutely. In fact, one of the, our Ground Zero members is a former commander uh, of, of a nuclear submarine. So we have uh, a lot of uh, veterans. And then, of course, I myself am a, I'm a veteran of uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. So a lot of us have uh, strange journeys. But going back to what you were saying about leafleting, yes, I, I get out there and leaflet at, at 6.30 in the morning as the Bangor employees drive in to work in the morning. There's usually two or three of us passing out uh, uh, leaflets. And of course, uh, occasionally we get yelled at by the employees. We had one man yelling at us saying, you know, uh, what are you doing? Don't you realize that nuclear weapons uh, saved lives? And or don't you realize that, that you know, that people think that we're, we just don't understand history. But in fact, if you look at the historical record, it shows that in fact, the purpose uh, uh, for the dropping of the bomb on the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had very little to do with ending the war. In fact, um, the record shows that the Japanese had already submitted uh, um, surrender, uh, willingness to surrender. They had submitted a proposal. And um, at the time, though, the, um, uh, the Soviet Union was starting to make uh, forays into Eastern Europe, and it was thought that dropping the bomb would impress the Soviets and indicate to them that uh, we would not be afraid to use the bomb. In other words, that it would be a, a deterrent. And uh, that was actually the beginning of the Cold War. So it's, uh, it's a very sad thing to say, but the, that the civilian populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, were victimized so that we could send a message to the Soviet Union. And I would encourage your listeners to do their own research and not just pay attention to what um, you're told in the mainstream media because, of course, um, anytime there's a, a, a war or something unpleasant, it has to be sold to the public. So uh, you, have to, you have to figure it out for yourself. I think everyone knows the saying that the first casualty of a war is truth. And certainly in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, I, think, I think people were deceived and, and, and went along with it because they thought that, well, we had to end the war. And no, the, the war was ready to be finished. And those truths and myths are still perpetuated up till this day. I know that uh, PBS had a special this week on the bomb and a bunch of the myths about the use of the, the reasons for the use of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were again repeated in that, uh, that supposed documentary. Absolutely. It was, it was really interesting. Um, they featured um, Joseph Serincioni, who is um, head of the, uh, I be believe it's called the Plowshares Fund, and his question was, you know, why why is the Navy going to spend nearly a trillion dollars to upgrade, um, not just upgrade, but sort of uh, put out a whole 14 brand new uh, Trident submarines, which would cost just this humongous amount of money. I mean, I th I think they actually gave gave the figure of 100 billion dollars just to be accurate here uh that's that's including not just the submarines but the research and development but the question was if one submarine can cause an armageddon how many do we need and i thought that was a really valid question to ask and of course the other the other thing is and and this wasn't really brought out it too much in the program but you know uh, if american children are going hungry if our bridges are collapsing if our infrastructure is going down if children don't have or are, are overcrowded in the schools and we don't have enough school is this really where we want to spend our taxpayer dollars and i think that that's that's a question that everyone should think about and i think people should um, be active in approaching their senators approaching their representatives um, and and pushing back on this expansion Do, and, and, and the Navy itself has said that it cannot afford it that there would have to be a special fund you know so you know you can imagine the mission creep all the different uh, uh, military services then maybe the army would decide well we can't afford our expansion you know where's the money for our special fund so th I think it's we don't want to go there if we can so Talk about your a little more about your personal journey. I mean, how does a person who's working at the CIA uh, and other agencies for 27 years end up 
protesting with Ground Zero and protesting at Lockheed Martin? Well, it, it was a gradual sort of awareness. Um, the first 20 years of my career, I was fortunate. I worked on the open source side of the CIA. It was a fun job. I got to be an editor um, that edited, uh, translated news from all around the world. Um, it was a part of the CIA that was known as the Foreign Broadcast Information Service. It's now known as the Open Source Center. And it's quite an open secret at the CIA that they, they actually will, will tell you that 90% of the best information is all open source. <laughs> and the, the covert information is only as good as, as, as the sources they get. And uh, unfortunately, that line is shrinking as, as more information is being monitored through technology, through, through the NSA and such. So uh, I worked on the open source side and, and I began to become in uh, in the run-up to the Iraq War in 2002, when it was clear to me that uh, this talk about weapons of mass destruction was not accurate. And in fact, I was personally tasked with trying to find also this link that was purported between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. And I actually had to leverage our resources out in, you know, out in the Middle East to see, you know, what they wanted us to find, you know, press confirmation of this, and there wasn't any, and yet there was this consistent hammering at us analysts that we're, you're, you're not you're not finding it but it's there you know and, and and you know the weapons of mass destruction are there and so when when uh, our country went ahead and went to war in march 2003 um, my heroes were people like colonel ann wright who was a former diplomat who resigned her job uh in 2003 in protest against the war and while i didn't take that step until uh, years later, when I when I actually left as soon as I could retire in 2010, I did start participating in protest actions, and I went up to Kenny Bunkport uh, to block the entrance to the Bush compound in 2007, and that's where I met Colonel Ann Wright personally, and I met um, Cindy Sheehan and, and a lot of other really interesting activists, and I sort of felt that that's where my heart is, and that's where I belong. So when I did leave um, the government in 2010, Colonel Ann Wright was the one that alerted me to um, an, an action that was happening at Ground Zero and told me, well, I think you might find some kindred spirits there, Elizabeth. So I, I moved to Washington State. I was actually born in Seattle, believe it or not, <laughs> many years ago. Um, but I always wanted to come back here and live. Um, and in 2012, I came to Ground Zero to... Uh, participate in an action and I met the great late Bill Bixell and uh, actually uh, Jim and Shelley Douglas were there in 2012 and and that was a treat because they had already uh, moved to Birmingham Alabama to be with the Catholic worker years before and they had flown out so I had the chance to meet them I met many interesting people and I that sort of became a second home for me at, at the time I was living in Bellingham and then in uh, I guess uh, summer of 2014 the member in residence position came open and that was a whole new level of participation because that got me into the monthly leafleting I became much more active since I was close in and just the whole idea of, of nonviolent resistance seems correct to me because when you see that your country is violating international law violating the Nuremberg principles um, basically threatening the world with just the presence of nuclear weapons. I, I, I don't really think, I don't think that, that our history has shown that this, this uh, cachet of weapons has done anything to help us go to peace. And people are always saying, you know, oh, yes, you've got to have uh, peace through strength, right? Well, I think we should try strength through peace because the other, the other one hasn't worked. So, um, and also... Another dimension to this is during my years in the agency, I started to pick up books and read about the lives of people like Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton. Um, I myself come from a Catholic tradition, although I was, I'm sort of a lapsed Catholic. And the Ground Zero Center has a strong Catholic tradition, with especially with the participation of people like uh, Father St Father Bill Bixell, Father Steve Kelly, um, and others. And although I think there's just um, a, a huge 
variety of people that are simply people of conscience and you don't have to be from any particular background so it was a it was an interesting journey but i feel uh feel very good being with this community of people was there any has there been any fallout from your former employers with the work you're doing now <laughs> fallout i like your choice of <laughs> words actually no i, I I do write articles based on some of my recent experience or my experiences while I worked, but I do um, I do try to adhere to uh, not revealing classified information. I try to stay within the realm of, of open information, which actually is easy for me since I worked in open source for for most of of my career. But uh, thus far, I haven't seen any. I, I think I think there was there was repercussions while I was working there, though. I, after I w I was found to be protesting at at these various uh, venues in in the two thousands during during the U.S. active war in Iraq. I mean, I know we're still there, but this was like after two thousand and seven when uh, a photo of me somehow managed to land across my manager's desk. I did find myself sort of relegated to. Uh, a small cubicle and I found that, that the interesting jobs went to other people and I was definitely marginalized. I, I think the message was clear and actually you know now that you mention it as far as fallout um, I think what has happened to me has happened to a lot of my colleagues um, in, an, in, the, in the intelligence circles uh, such as Ray McGovern and others. Um, I certainly have lost friends and colleagues um, from work. I think that, that you become a little bit radioactive when you do a lot of truth-telling. And that's a natural thing, and I think that um, the good thing is that it's been, those, those friends have been replaced by people that I have much, much more in common with. So I think that we all evolve in our lives, we all change, and, um, you know, I, I, I went from having a job where I think toward the end, the end of my career, you know, I was actually um, chauffeur driven to meetings downtown and, and, and that sort of thing. And now I find myself cleaning toilets at the Ground Zero Center, and I'm just fine with it. So it's it's been great. Well, since you used to specialize in, in uh, looking through open source media, by your by those current those standards back then uh, would they consider what we do on social media now to be open source or how would that yeah actually uh, they 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 do monitor social media a lot and in fact when social media first exploded onto the scene that became a whole new area for them so yeah most most definitely you know Twitter Facebook all that sort of thing that's that that all comes under the purview of uh, of intelligence monitoring and in fact you know I'm sure that um, uh, Edward Snowden and Julian Assange could tell you more <laughs> but actually um, if I may I'd like to talk a little bit about our upcoming action I'd like to encourage people to come out to the Ground Zero Center uh, starting Friday uh, August the 7th through uh, Monday August the 10th uh, we're going to be commemorating um, the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We have the, the Peace Walkers coming in. They, they are in, in Olympia today. This is a, uh, a Peace Walk that's sponsored by the, the Buddhist monks at the Nipponzan Myohoji Monastery. And they will be, I think they're going to, from Olympia to Tacoma. They'll be in Tacoma, I believe, the day after tomorrow. Then they're going to Seattle and they're going to end up at the Ground Zero Center on Saturday, August 8th. And if anyone is interested in participating in the Peace Walk, you can still join them. Um, you can contact, uh, for more information, you can um, write to info at gzcenter.org. And I'll repeat that, info at gzcenter.org. Uh, the Ground Zero Center also has a Facebook page. Um, you can Google that, or you can go to our website at gzcenter.org. But the weekend is free. I would also tell people who might be a little shy about participating in an action that your participation can just be anything from just being a witness to being a supporter, all the way to um, joining some folks in blocking the entrance to the naval base, which we're planning to do 
on Monday morning. And I should also add that because the Ground Zero has been there for 30 plus years, we actually are part of the community and we're very well known to the law enforcement. I think we have a good understanding with them. And I would even go so far as to say that many of them sympathize with us and agree with us. Um, I also would like to add that um, when I do my morning leafleting uh, uh, once a month, we get a lot of thumbs up from the employees that go in. I think there are many more people that you can imagine that are literally on our side of the fence. It's just that people have to make a living and we understand that we're not, you know, we're not against the people that work there. We just um, ob object to the danger that these missiles pose and we want to work together with the community to find a way to reduce and then eliminate those weapons eventually. And, um, you know, another thing I'd like to add is that um, none of us expect that this, this kind of nonviolent action or this kind of nonviolent resistance could necessarily result in, in anything immediate. I think that we're just called on to be faithful to the cause, to keep pushing, and nothing meaningful was ever accomplished overnight. I mean, look, look how long it took for women to get the vote, for example. Um, I do think that there's a history of showing that, that um, diplomacy works. I mean, um, President Kennedy working with um, uh, Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union w was able to stand down the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, even our own president back in 2013, again to, uh, together with Russia, was able to convince um, President Assad of Syria to destroy his chemical weapons stockpiles. Um, after that big um, issue in Syria where, where it was alleged that um, the Syrian government was supposedly responsible for a chemical attack, I think if you look at the facts closely, um, it was probably the Sy Syrian rebels. There's a lot of good information on this on consortiumnews.com, um, very much uh, fact-based reporting on what happened back then. But again, I mean, we averted a crisis. We, we managed to eliminate the nuclear stockpiles. Again, this year, we've made an, a, a peace arrangement with Iran. We have a nuclear deal with Iran that we, we're, we're really showing that diplomacy can work. So. I think with fewer weapons and more diplomacy, I think it's not only a way of just building trust, but establishing some credibility uh, with, with our desire to put forward the non-proliferation treaty and encourage other countries to uh, reduce and eliminate their stockpiles. I think that uh, we, you know, there's there's a perception of a little bit of hypocrisy on our part if we're building up our nuclear stockpiles rather than trying to downsize. So we, we, we educate on all of this together with um, our partners. We have the Physicians for Social Responsibility that will be coming to do talks uh, on that weekend. And uh, again, uh, everyone is welcome. There's free food. There's going to be music. I believe Tom Rawson is going to be singing. So I would encourage everyone to, to come out. And, and I know that back in the 80s, there were hundreds and thousands of people that would come to Ground Zero to, to, to block the arrival of nuclear weapons, um, to block uh, the white train that came. So, you know, these people have, you know, you've all, all you people have still got to be out there somewhere. Um, I would encourage people who have maybe given up or felt disillusioned, I would say that you can help us revive. There, there's a, I think there's a revival in this country um, of activism. It began with Occupy. Um, we had this impressive uh, Shell No uh, Chi activist uh, action in Seattle and just yesterday in Portland, um, a very strong showing of folks who made every effort to block that icebreaker from making it to the Arctic. So um, I would say to all the people who were there in the 70s and 80s, please come back. Please come to us on the 70th anniversary. Let's, let's begin again. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Pleasure.